Party of two. Do we have a party of two? Okay. You and you? Come on down. Yeah, we've got a party of two right over here. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Party of Two podcast. I'm one of your hosts, the Internet's Mark Bidonica. Uh, my wife is not joining us today because I'm on location. I'm in a, I'm in a spooky location. So we're doing a, a Spookums episode uh, with the one, the only, one of one of my dear, dear friends, Mr. Ty Matthews. Hi, Mark Donica. Hi, Ty Matthews. We, we're, we're here because you're such a hauntum boy. Uh, <laughs> you can say that. Sure. <laughs> for at, for uh, lack of a better term. Mm-hmm. And and ultimately, we're not. We're, we're not... We don't like getting scared because we're very punchy, right? And and we're concerned for the health of various <laughs> employees. It's fair. It's certainly not for everyone. No. So uh, bef- before we get started about uh, Dad Hot Life, yes. uh, hashtag Dad Hot Life. <laughs> uh, something that we did on our first episode is we did the the five most important theme park questions. So in order to help the the folks learn about you a little bit more, and also we recently had a conversation where I didn't I I had no idea you were such a big theme park. Huge person. theme park fan, absolutely, and and it it makes sense and all. It's it's just something that that wasn't written on a wall and pasted on my face. <laughs> so uh, we want to start with what is your favorite ride? God, that's such a tough one. I know, I know. If uh, for for the sake of 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 not thinking for hours and hours and hours, I the the very first thing that comes into my head is probably Indiana Jones and the Temple of Forbidden Eye. It's kind of perfect, isn't it's it? It's so like. The only reason that I even have any doubt is only because I've ridden it so many times. <laughs> and so and no matter how good something is, it'll hit a point of diminishing returns at some point. But it's just it's so perfectly themed and it's that kind of perfect hybrid of a, of a dark ride and a thrill ride. Mm-hmm. And that the, Space Mountain was a very, very, very close second. But which Space Mountain? Because there's there were several eras of Space Mountain. Have you been on the one in Florida? Have you been on the I've one not. in France? I've um, do they have? So the one in the one they in, do they have the Jules Verne one in France, right? Yes, you know, yes, 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 okay. yes. That was closed for refurbishment when I was there, That's so I was awful. I was very very bummed out. But it's right now it's getting to be. I think they're reopening it to be a little bit closer to the American one. I see. Okay, yeah, they smoothed it out a little bit. Um. It's definitely the Anaheim version. Mm-hmm. Um, which era? Probably like the Dick Dale, like surf guitar kind of era. Nice. Um, that was when I was a kid, and we'll probably get more into this. But when I was a kid, I was scared of everything. I was Interesting. terrified of absolutely everything, especially I mean, Space Mountain. Same. Yeah, and so um, when I first started kind of warming up to it and started kind of being able to go on it was during the the Dick Dale era. So that is kind of synonymous with me overcoming this kind of fear in my childhood. Just grasping um, onto it and be like, no, you're mine. Exactly, exactly. So that that era probably um, – I'm a huge fan of Ghost Galaxy though, obviously. Yeah. Um, and I was even a fan of like when they did like Rock and Space Mountain. Hell yeah, the you were. <laughs> there, was a, there was a point where I had it on my iPhone and I, <laughs> and I would play it at the right moment. And just because like – um, with Uncle Joe Benson being like a local radio yeah. celebrity and a big Chili Peppers fan, and it's <laughs> it's like it was so cool. And every every board that I used to go to was just like, oh, this is garbage. They're ruining the original. Like, just have some fun every exactly. once in a while. Exactly. Come on. I think we're I think we're similar in that regard. In that, like, as much as we love theme parks, we're not too precious about like updates or layovers or or things like that you know because it's just more it's, exactly because you have the memories of the classic thing right and then it's going to be an evolving thing and it's something where you get to share with a cousin or a or a child or yeah. whatever just being you know it used to be like oh really tell me about it you get to tell a story and all that stuff it's it's funny on that point as as much as i love haunted mansion holiday um i'm i'm interning for an improv class right now and my improv teacher made a really good point where he's like there's not much that's more Halloween than the original Haunted Mansion. And the fact that you can't ride it during Halloween is so frustrating. Yeah, It's yeah. a very good point. As much as I love Haunted Mansion Holiday, it's a very good point. It's it's really unfortunate. He's like, why would you just come every other time of year? <laughs> well, it's, if I wanted some additional spoops, because there, there are some other spoops. But the, the, the fact that you, you give it Christmas, you could wait a little 
bit. Right. Just exactly. wait. A little, just wait a little bit. Right. But uh, I'm, at I'm ex- least split October a little bit. Right. Just, just uh, give it a week. <laughs> and uh, man, but uh, in in terms of Indiana Jones, something yes. that can refresh your palate on that is going on the French version. Did you did you go on the the, the coaster? Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because it's awful. Yeah, I was really bummed. <laughs> okay, I was wondering where you're going with <laughs> no, that. No, because it's you. You like oh Indiana Jones. What's this gonna be like? Oh. That was bad. Exactly. <laughs> I think that was the very first ride I went on when I went. And it was very early in the morning and I was so pumped. And I was like, oh, oh, this is what this is. Oh, boy. Well, all right. <laughs> Goodbye, everybody. Good luck getting that that extra budget. <laughs> that Okay, cool. Indiana Jones and or Dick Dale Space Mountain. Very yeah, good, definitely. Very good. Now, when you're at these theme parks, mm-hmm. you, you, have to, you have to eat. Or else, or else you, you'll die. <laughs> That's what I've heard, sure. <laughs> That's what I've heard. Yeah. Uh, so what is your favorite snack or, be- like, because they, they have some, quote, mixed drinks, not sure. necessarily alcoholic, but sure, sure. They, they have fun beverages and stuff that you can get from park to park. Do you have a favorite? It's not a day at, at a park unless I have something like this. See, I'm not a big snack guy no? when I go to parks. I, like... Um, I, I don't eat as often as I probably should just in terms of like number of meals throughout the day, but I typically tend to eat a large breakfast and then go to the park and hold myself off as, as much as possible. Um, if I do eat, it's chances are it's a plain cheeseburger usually. Um, but if I had to pick anything, it would probably be the, the Mickey ice cream sandwiches. Yeah. I'm a big, big fan of ice cream sandwiches. So if the mood strikes me and it has to strike me just right. It'll be it'll be a, a Mickey ice cream sandwich because it can hurt your teeth too. That's the only other thing is I have yeah, to kind of pace myself because they're they're very very frozen. Right. So you have to hit that it it. So that's interesting. It has to be the right moment mm-hmm. and it has to spend the right amount of time in gestating in your hand in your pocket whatever. Right. So that you can get that perfect smooth. I was gonna say crunch, but it's not a crunch. Just that. Mm, just that. Yeah. Just yeah. that deliciousness. It's 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 not a crunch, but it's crunch adjacent. Mm-hmm. You know. Yeah. Uh, I I have a feeling for this next one. I know the general area that I'm you're sure going to you be do, in, yeah. but I'm excited to hear what you say. Was your favorite entertainment offering? So like oh. a parade or or like a sh- or a show, something like that. I would I would have to go with the Waterworld stunt show. Yeah, honestly. all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm a uh, I'm a huge fan of kind of the just the post apocalyptic aesthetic in general. Mm-hmm. But there was a while where I was just obsessed with Universal Studios because I'm not far. It takes me maybe 15 minutes to get there, you know, not even using freeways. And so for a while, I loved just like absolutely adored going to Universal. And so the Waterworld stunt show and just the fact that like a film that was such a commercial failure and such a notorious flop is still, as of this recording, is still being presented as a stunt show. Is kind of funny to me, and it, it's slowly making those box office returns back. Slowly, <laughs> slowly, we're still, working, we're still working on it. We'll and get that's there. The thing people get it confused. People get the fact that it lost a lot of money confused with the fact that it's a bad movie. Mm. Don't get me wrong; it's not a great movie, <laughs> but there are certainly worse films out there. Yeah, um, it, it was just obscenely expensive. It presents such a unique opportunity for stunt actors and actors in general. Mm. It's not your average. The, the stunt shows, I feel like, are kind of falling by the wayside now because yeah everybody can find out how everything's done you don't have to see it in action that's a good point Absolutely. but the, there's something so inherently charming about the water world show and one of my favorite things and one of my sort of dream theme park experiences in japan in the summer they get an overlay from shonen jump so the water world show becomes a one-piece show oh wow and they had the characters the voice actors voice over the stuff so the actors are just mouthing along to it so you're like oh that's luffy oh that's zoro oh that's everybody i had no idea it's super cool and every, they change it up every once in a while so it's not the same story every time and it's mm. cur- quote current enough sure with the anime and like a sliding scale of like a season or more two. current than Waterworld would be <laughs> a lot more current than water would be so it it despite i the the popularity of that theater kind of stays high in japan so even if we lose it here we're like well okay we can we can i definitely want to go during the summer to see the one piece version but we they still have the water world show the rest of the year that's so fascinating it's crazy but yeah one of my one of my favorite things i always love going to theme parks with someone that hasn't been to that park before like it's just like 
I don't know. It's that dumb part of my brain that's just like, let me show you the cool things, you know? <laughs> and so, and that's happened a lot. Like a lot of my friends from Australia have visited and, you know, they, Disneyland might not necessarily be in their budget. So mm. like, we'll go to Universal or something like that. And I always love that moment in the Waterworld show when that biplane just comes over the wall and like nobody ever <laughs> expects that, you yeah. know? And so that's, that's always been one of my kind of favorite moments there too. Mm. It, it, Yeah. One of it, keeping the surprise alive of for anything really, and I, I bet you like walk right behind them just to see. I'm constant. I'm so bad about just like always kind of looking out of the corner of my eye. Like, are they enjoying it? Are they enjoying it? Whenever we go on Revenge of the Mummy, which is I think gets kind of a bad rap. I think the Hollywood version of Revenge of the Mummy gets a bad rap. It's pretty good. It's, it's I think it's, it's enjoyable. It's a fun. It's a fun coaster. It's it's not nearly as good as the Orlando version. Mm-hmm. I think, but I enjoy it. But one of my favorite things on that ride is always never saying anything about that initial launch <laughs> and then just seeing their face in the picture. <laughs> That's what there's a fantastic picture of me and Carlo Cannon his very first time on that ride and I had given him absolutely zero warning about that launch. Great. It's incredible. <laughs> well, I had a fun uh, fun interaction with with Carlo a couple days ago. It was really random. I hadn't talked to him in a really long time. Yeah. I was just like Oh man, I miss Mark Donica. I went, oh hey, Carlo, what's up? I love Carlo. You guys, you guys want, you he's want to such talk? a genuine boy. I love it. Yeah. Oh, he's he's a he's a nice boy to take around. Uh, oh my goodness, how how he needs to come back so you could show him the set of Superstore. <laughs> <laughs> and inside joke. <laughs> uh, was that a show when he was over here? It was pr- probably pretty. It may have been early. brand new. But not. But who knows? Maybe That's not. amazing. What? Uh, so so. Next question I have for you mm-hmm. here: Dark ride. So your uh, Snow White scary adventures, your haunted mansions, or thrill ride roller coasters. What? Which of those two do you prefer? Dark ride, one hundred percent. Yeah. As much as I love thrill thrill rides and and coasters and stuff like that, and I think we'll get into it a little bit when we talk about haunts. But just being immersed in a narrative and and just being in the story, like there's nothing cooler than that. To yeah. Me. I think that's what drew me to theme parks in the first place you know and I, I like that there's starting to be a little bit more of a focus on adding that story element to the thrill rides yes exactly and it's not as much of a of a thrill ride but the snow white uh seven dwarves mine train in florida yeah. is a start mm. there's a it's a it's a family coaster so it's not absolutely crazy but it's a fun ride system with the swinging, uh, the swinging cars, yeah. and you stop every little bit for story. And then the new Harry Potter coaster that's coming to Florida through the Forbidden Forest is said to have a lot of story elements in it. So there Ooh. might be some show building. I didn't know about might, that. Yeah. So the, so it's it, they're starting to incorporate it a little bit more. And even the little bit that we get from the Incredible Hulk coaster, yes, exactly. I, I think yeah. is, is a fun enough to where it's like, all right, we're experimenting. Oh, Hulk's here. Pong. Exactly. Or or like on on the same Harry Potter point, I think that's one of the best things about Escape from Gringotts mm-hmm. is that it's got such strong elements of both, you know? Mm-hmm. And even Revenge of the Mummy, yes. so all of the Universal seems to be nailing it. And the the final final question on this list: What extinct attraction would you revive? This was probably the toughest one. I'm obsessed with Defunct Land, mm-hmm. as I'm sure that that you are as well. Yep. Um, yeah, there are some factoids that I will not attribute to them just because <laughs> they're in my brain. Right, exactly, yeah. No, this was a really, really hard question. I would probably say uh, Back to the Future, the ride. Mm. As as much as I love, love, love the Simpsons ride because I adore that ride, I only ever got to ride Back to the Future once, and it was before I had ever seen any of the films. Oh, my God. And there, I mean, as you can see, it's one of my absolute favorite, favorite films and Flip, so uh, to be able to go back and, and write it with the appreciation and with the knowledge that I have now, because it took me a long time to see those films. I didn't see those films until maybe 2009, 2010, like pretty recently, My God. relatively speaking. And so the fact that, yeah, I never got to write it with that appreciation always kind of killed me. If I may, mm-hmm. you butthead. I know. <laughs> Come on. Exactly. No, I mean, that that it's it's similarly to... To people talking about Star Wars in a similar vein of like, oh, I just haven't seen it, sort of a thing. And it's like, there's so much like awesome stuff to experience. Exactly. But do you have the the anniversary one where it has all of the ride yes. stuff from it? Yeah. Yes. Then, and that's and that's the thing. Like it, 
it probably wouldn't hold up that great, you know? I mean, Tom's performance as Biff is, <laughs> I mean, because it's, it's 50s Biff, so it's like really, it's really <laughs> out there. Sure. Like even just the, like, there, yes, there, there's appreciation of seeing these characters again, but then placing all of that sort of within the narrative structure of the movie and you're like none of this makes any sense (laughs) this is really really hammy and silly but it's part of the fun and even just and like biff is referencing himself from the movies like it's it's uh, yeah so weird yeah it gets a little bit it gets a little bit kind of wonky but it would either yeah so it would either be that or like Maybe the very first maze that Knotts ever did, mm-hmm. like back in like 73, something like that, just to see what it was like back then. Where it's come know? from. Yeah. Or uh, uh, the the Beetlejuice rock and roll. Oh, uh, man. Universal Monsters rock and roll review or whatever. <laughs> sure. Or Spider-Man rocks. The only thing, the only other thing that I thought of, I don't know if you know this, it, at Halloween Horror Nights in... 2000 mm-hmm. in the year 2000 universal had done a couple years of halloween horror nights then didn't do it and then brought it back in 06 and it's been going ever since mm-hmm. but in 2000 they had a maze based on the undertaker what and it was the story of the undertaker and kane is there any video footage i don't think so i've looked so hard oh but God. here's the thing this was American Badass era Undertaker. Oh, no. So you just go around corners and you just see guys just revving motorcycles at you. <laughs> and then there would just be like Kane behind a chain link fence, which is supposed to represent Hell in a Cell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was called The Undertaker No Mercy. And oh, no. I heard it was real bad. I heard it was real bad, but... Well, this, it's pre... Like golden era Halloween Horror Nights, exactly. Like how good can it be? If it was, if it was golden era Halloween Horror Nights, and if it was like, if they were able to really tap into like the extreme lore of the Undertaker and Kane, well, it didn't entirely exist because that was way before uh, Cena Weevil, which yes. was was kind of. And that's the thing. Yeah, I was thinking the other day if it had been like Welder's Mask Kane, maybe like that could really lend itself. And him making the leather ma- ish mask, yeah, or something like yeah. That. But no, this was classic. Like classic era Kane and American Badass era Undertaker. And Are, so, <laughs> yeah, I can't believe it. I think I, I want to say I can't believe it. I want to say that year they did they did the Undertaker maze. They had a Rob Zombie maze, uh, and then they had a uh, I think a Buffy maze, Buffy and Angel maze. Ooh, yeah, 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 yeah. Man, if if uh, if. I would love for them to bring that back just so I could audition to be one of the uh, one of the bikers, <laughs> right? Because they just need a bunch of big dudes. Yeah, just big dudes, just revving motorcycles. <laughs> every 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 at the end of every hallway, you just hear "dead man walking." <laughs> you done it now, <laughs> dude. That was such a trip to hear that in the new two K. Right, like going through the jukebox, I was like, "Yup, select that." <laughs> Oh boy! So so now we're we're on haunts. Thank you, thank you. We know you a little bit more. Yes. I know you a little bit more mm-hmm. in in your theme park history. Where you talked about being afraid of some attractions yeah. and and then sort of harnessing that and and making it your own. Where did your love of haunts start? I mean, I think it it definitely ties back to just being scared of everything. Yeah. Just when I was a kid, like. Um, my family would go to Disneyland every year and, and it was only, it was just once a year. It was a strictly once a year thing. And it was always for my brother's birthday. Cause it was a tradition from before mm-hmm. I was around. And, um, for some reason, I don't know what it was, but there was just something about everything that, that always kind of scared me. I remember <laughs> there was a time I somehow must have seen a picture of the Yeti in like a brochure or a commercial or something like that. And so I was not about the Matterhorn at all. Okay. And I was I had to have been about three or four, and my mom, bless her heart, thought that, oh, once he gets on and once he sees that it's just a ride, like, he'll be fine. I was not fine. I proceeded to scream the entire time. And that legitimately put me off of really any sort of ride wow. until I was maybe 10, something like that. Um, anything that was indoors didn't trust. I have vivid remember. I have vivid memories of screaming and crying, even getting on the boats at Pirates. Uh, wow! Let alone a haunted mansion. Just because you can't see where you're going. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Because when you go in the dark, 
I I don't know. There was just something in my mind that's like you don't know what's gonna happen. That's the lo- that's sound logic. It's like I don't, I can't see what's happening exactly. I and it was outside. I could see the stuff going out and coming right. back in. Yeah, exactly. So it was stuff in the dark, and it was stuff that went upside down. Mm-hmm. And then sometimes I would conflate the two. Like, well, if it goes in the dark, it certainly goes upside down. Like, why would they? Why would they spoil why that? Wouldn't they? Yeah, exactly. But as I got older. I started making sort of concessions for like coasters that were out in the open and didn't go upside down. So um, Buffalo Bills at State Line, like I was perfectly fine going on Desperado, even oh though at the time, God. even though at the time it was the tallest, fastest, steepest coaster, you know. Um, but, even, but even like looking at it with any sort of logic and compared to any of the rest, you're like that is that doesn't yeah. look. But like in in my head, I justified it as like if if they're okay with it being out in the open and I can see that it doesn't go upside down, must be fine. <laughs> so it would be like that. It would be colossus at at magic mountain and and stuff like that but um when it came to to haunts and haunted houses i was still very apprehensive Mm. even and that went on pretty late like i remember going to not scary farm for the very first time in 2002 with my my brother and his then girlfriend now wife um and so i would have been 16 at the time and I went, but like I was still very, very anxious and very apprehensive, and that anxiety wasn't fun at the time. Um, oh, you, oh, you you don't say. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Preaching the Maybe fire. Maybe terrified. Didn't care for it. <laughs> but for some reason, as the years went by, um, I started being more kind of intrigued about it and that's kind of how i was with horror movies in general when i was a kid i i was terrified of horror films and they would give me nightmares and um just as i got older it sort of started creating this backlash effect where i started like kind of craving that adrenaline rush you know and so 2006 was the first year that like i i actively chose to go to not scary farm interesting and then and then I started being more intrigued and being more curious. And so 2007, I was like, well, what if I go to Knott's and Universal and kind of see how they both do it and see how they compare the two? Um, and then 2008 is when everything went off the tracks because I was – dang it. I should have I should have found it. I was writing for my college newspaper at mm-hmm. the time, um, the, the UCR Highlander newspaper, and the Halloween issue was coming up. And we didn't really have anything to fill the pages or anything really content wise. And I had just started learning that there were haunts outside of the major parks, that Mm. there were like these local, like the indies of haunts, basically. (laughs) Um, There were, uh, there's a a tiny little amusement park in Ontario called Scandia. Mm -hmm. And I started learning that they had a maze and that Castle Park in Riverside, which was the local mini golf amusement park that i constantly went to as a child wait did they or do they still who's that castle park oh yeah 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 yeah. interesting they're not that great i mean sure but but yeah castle park has mazes yeah yeah interesting. Yeah, yeah. um they used to i don't know if they have this anymore but they had a little train that would go around the entire perimeter of the park and it was so slow and so low to the ground that the monsters would be able to climb onto it it was really cool. No. Yeah. No, thank you. And so, so yeah, so 2008, I, I pitched it to my editors. I was like, well, what if I just go to literally every haunt that I could possibly think of and just write about all of them? Huh. And that's where it all started. And that's where I started because I'm a completionist at, at heart, you know? <laughs> and so it became a thing where I was like, well, if it's a haunt and if it's open, I have to do it. And so that's kind of where it all where it all really started. In fact, if you look right behind you, that's Ooh. from that's from my very first time at, at Halloween Horror Nights. Oh wow! <laughs> not that, but oh, no, the, that right there. Ugh. Yeah. No, yeah. not that. No, no, that yeah, picture. Yeah. yeah. But either, it, <laughs> there's a lot here. There's a lot. There's a there's a, a head floating in a jar. <laughs> Is that King George? Oh, that's King George. Yep. <laughs> That's my what, my, what a wonderful display. My grandfather was a big fan of those mugs, and so I inherited that from him. That's cool. But that's really um, cool. but yeah, and so that's kind of where it all really started. And I've done a lot of 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 um, um, psychoanalysis and mm. court, sort of self assessment as to why I love all of these things, but. The closest thing that I can come is just like the idea of suspension of disbelief. Mm. Like I, we were just talking about magic before before we went live, and like 
I have been obsessed with magic since I was a kid and I love pro wrestling and I love haunted houses. And I think the common thread between all of those things is this idea of suspension of disbelief. I was going to say the undertaker, but yeah, also the undertaker. (laughs) Um, But the fact that we're all kind of rational free thinking adults and that we can all come together for X amount of minutes at these things and all agree to pretend that what we're seeing is real, you know, that's slowly going away, but sure. But I think I think that's a big reason that that haunts are so appealing to me. Yeah, is is just everyone knows that these are just actors and mm-hmm. masks getting paid wages to do this as a job. Yeah, but that suspension of disbelief is so palpable that people will run if they're being chased by a chainsaw. Yeah, there. I, I haven't quite found the sweet spot for me, but as a as a performer and in college, especially knowing a lot of people that worked at Halloween Horror Nights and it just not working out with my schedule. Sure. Because I, I think if I had worked there, it would have helped out a ton. I see. Okay. Ultimately, in terms of effects and this and that. But I'm, I'm a big fan of the technology that goes into some of this stuff because especially modern Horror Nights is such an advancement when it comes to live theater and live entertainment. Right. To the point where... They got they they got to do that now they get to do it a year round with the Walking Dead attraction mm-hmm. and even that I was like oh, I want to see how they do this oh I hear they have this cool animatronic I want to see this so I en- I end up watching all of this stuff like I've watched I believe I've watched all of the mazes from Horror Nights this year sure just to be like that's cool that's cool that's why I'm I love so how glad. they did that I'm so glad that there's those POV videos mm-hmm. I think Sharp Productions are the ones that do like. The best ones, the most I think kind that, of that actually might have been who I who I saw. They're fantastic, yeah, yeah. yeah. And that's why I love it because it's it's definitely not for everyone. Mm-hmm. Like it's not one of those type of things where I don't get when people aren't into it. Like <laughs> it's certainly understandable, <laughs> and that's sort of the the balance that I have to kind of strike is the reason that I'm able to kind of still get that rush mm-hmm. is because like getting startled is inherently unpleasant. Yeah, and so it becomes kind of a game of sort of one-upsmanship of can I stay one step ahead of them and, and not get scared. And (laughs) when they do, when they are successful, that's why I just bust out laughing and Mm. clapping is because like, damn it, you got me. Been got. Done been got. Exactly. I I got got. (laughs) I, I, I love this. I, I love, love your passion because you, we've been talking about it for years and you've been talking to me about, I just went to this one. I went to that one Our one of our most recent post Lucha conversations that just happened naturally. I, I, I can't believe the, the, in, in the best possible way. Mm-hmm. I can't believe the links that you go to, oh, me to neither. find <laughs> some of the coolest or not coolest stuff around the country. I counted the other day. I think I've been to uh, haunted attractions in 15 States. At 15. This, that's at this good. Point. Yeah. 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 So still working on it. How often now? Now everybody sort of puts the the spotlight on these things around Halloween time, mm. but how frequently do these things continue? Not as frequently. Um, there have been companies that have tried to put on year round haunts, mm. and it's always a good idea on paper because it's like, oh, there's there's nothing for people that want to do it year round, but there's just not enough interest. Yeah. Uh, Eli Roth a couple years ago tried to open the Goratorium, which was a year round haunt in Las Vegas, uh. and it lasted about a year before it went bankrupt. Well, isn't there? And, and I know this because they 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 had a, a Five Nights at Freddy's walk through. There's there's isn't there like a scare zone. In Las Vegas? That's... Well, the there was the Fright Dome. Fright Dome. Yeah, there, there's yeah. the Fright Dome at Circus Circus, which just recently ended. Oh, I didn't um, know that. That had been around since 2003. Yeah, Interesting. Yeah, yeah. Fright Dome was never... In terms of Vegas haunts, there's actually one uh, called Freakling Brothers. Mm-hmm. That's one of my all-time favorite haunts. Is it like a combination of a freak show? It, not really. It's it's more just, just kind of a clever name, just okay. because the haunt industry loves puns. Yes. But... Um, it's called the Trilogy of Terror is this the event that they put on. And it's three different houses. And um, they're really, really elaborate, really well done. Mm-hmm. And the, the way that I discovered them is I, I wrestled there. I wrestled for, for Sin Bodhi at Freak Show Wrestling. Oh, nice. And for a while, they were setting up wrestling shows in the middle of the parking lot surrounded by haunted mazes. 
It was one of my favorite shows I've ever done. So set the scene for me. Tell me a little bit more about that. That seems very interesting because when yeah. it comes to pro wrestling, like mutual friend Robert Baines, mm-hmm. he, he he worked a, a hot sauce festival and it was just kind of in the middle of people burning their mouths off. You never know. Like, yeah, exactly. Like, So what, what sort of... Let's, let's take a, a trip of sure. the mind. T- t- tell me more about this event. So, okay, so... Um, the way that it was back then, I don't know if it still is. I'm pretty sure it's still the same way. But the Trilogy of Terror, um, imagine like a giant square inside a parking lot. And on three sides of the square are haunted mazes. Okay. Right in the middle of the square was the wrestling ring. Hmm. And so this being Freak Show Wrestling, it was sort of a half horror, half comedy kind of show. There was a, a haunt performer named Scorch the Clown. He was a fire-breathing clown, and he would be kind of part of both. He'd be part of the haunt and part of the wrestling show. Oh, boy. Yeah, and uh, I, myself, in my longer hair days, played the ghost of the Macho Man. I was going to ask what you did. Yep, I, w- I played the ghost of the then very recently deceased Randy Savage. Oh, boy. I For one time for Freak Show, I even wrestled Jake Roberts. As the ghost of the then recently deceased Randy Savage. And I had to kind of take, I, it was someone else that had taken over for Sin Bodhi and I had to take him aside and go like, Hey, Jake's okay with this. Right. Like I just kind of got thrown into the match at the last second, but like, I didn't know if anyone had warned Jake that someone would be portraying the specter of his dead friend. Mm. But, um, but no, for for that freak show when we were in the parking lot surrounded by mazes, I I wrestled Funny Bone in a hardcore match, and I don't know if you know Funny Bone. I don't know Funny Bone, but but really quickly, yes. So wait, did you you wrestled actual Jake the Snake? Actual Roberts. real life Jake the Snake Roberts. Okay, because I was okay. That took that took a minute for me to catch up. <laughs> I wasn't because sure if we had talked about that. before. No, we had because I th- I thought I thought. Because that I'd wrestled someone playing Jake the Snake, yeah. Because no. <laughs> with it being a, a costumed thing, and, and this that's and fair. That. No, that's a fair <laughs> assumption to come to. Especially, uh, I I had a, a moment in an airport recently mm. where I was like, "Is that Jake Roberts?" And it, <laughs> and it was. He ju- he looked like just real tired oh, and just no. real over it. Sleepy like we Jake. were we were on the same flight, and I was like. I'd really like to talk to him, but I he he's not ready to talk to anybody. Sure, right sure, now. sure, sure. So, but but just, I can't. no, he was fantastic. He it was a six man tag team match. Okay, and it was All him, right. Sin Bodhi, and and uh, and Funny Bone. And <laughs> if you don't know Funny Bone, you should look him up because he's fantastic. But he looks terrifying. Yeah. And so Freak Show was the very first time that I wrestled him, and I was very scared. How long has he been working? Um, a pretty long time. I want to say upwards of maybe 10, 15 years. Oh, he, wow. He used to be tag team partners with Bateman, with with our, our pal Oh, Bateman. all right. Yeah. They were the kind of the original Violence Unlimited. Interesting. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah, yeah. And so... Um, oh, that's terrifying. Yes. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> like in the best possible way. Yeah, no, exactly. He's got an amazing look. I love him to death. But... Um, but Jake was fantastic. Wrestling him was I didn't get to be in the ring that much with him, but it was it was such a cool experience. <laughs> Yo, I gotta check the hell out of Funny Bone's really Funny cool. Bone. There's a there's a match with him and Hammerstone. Oh yeah. That I gotta check yeah, out. Yeah, funny but he's a Vegas boy. That's why I wrestled him for, for Freak Show. Oh, that makes sense. Um, uh, really quickly while we're on YouTube, I found a piece of a a broadcast from WWE of The Undertaker. Mm-hmm. Walking through Undertaker, no mercy. <gasps> so, which which means there's an episode of Raw that is on the network that hopefully licensing. I mean, they're 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 USA. They're part of Universal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. License, Viacom owns Universal and USA. Yeah. Licensing permitting, you can watch in full high, stretched out high definition. <laughs> the Undertaker walking through. This crappy... no mercy. Oh, I have to see that. <laughs> I gotta. I'll, I'll. I'll. Just so I'm not on my phone the entire time. No, sure. I'll, I'll look it up and and see if we can find it and I'll capture it and maybe I can <sighs> share it in some way on on social media. That's incredible. Oh boy. Oh boy. That was um, an interesting image. But uh, but yeah. So to kind of go back to it. Um. Yeah. There was the there's the fright dome in Vegas and there's there's Freakling Brothers and but to kind of go back to what we were originally talking about. Year round haunts just don't really seem to work. Mm-hmm. There just aren't as many diehards out there that will go in the off season. But that being said, Christmas haunts are becoming very popular. Boy, I went to four different States just last year going to Christmas. Was that your, your train ride? 
No, 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 no. So my big cross country trip mm-hmm. that was 2014. Oh and my god! That started as kind of the what same way, is it? huh? <laughs> what year is it? I know, I know, right? <laughs> um, but that started in much the same way as my obsession with haunts did. In that, like, I started small, and I was just like, okay, I'll just go to this. That year, I was like, well, I've never been to Universal in Orlando, so I'll go there. I'll check out their Halloween Horror Nights because it's much bigger than the one in Hollywood. Huge. Um, and so I'll go out there and I'll check it out and I'll just kind of compare the two. And then eventually I was just like, well, what if I go to some other ones in Florida? And then I was like, well, New Orleans isn't that far. What if I go to haunts out there? And like, it just kind of kept ex- being extrapolated until I'm sitting at work with a map of the U S in front of me <laughs> on my desk going, okay, I'll go here and then here and then here and then here. And so I eventually, I took a two week excursion. I went to 12 States in two weeks going to different haunted attractions around the US. Was there one in every state that you stopped at? Um I mean that was the that was kind of the plan. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that I was basing my itinerary off of like these top ten best haunts in the country mm. lists. Um and so but the the route that I had to take was so wildly impractical because it's so hard to find stuff that's open on Mondays and Tuesdays and Wednesdays. Yeah. You know, most of them, even if if they've got wildly available hours, are open from Thursday to Sunday. And so, I had to go from like the East Coast down to the the Southeast to the West Coast back to the Midwest. Wow! And like it was a very very uh, inconvenient route. But of the of the fifteen states that you say you visited for in total, yeah, twelve of them were were, on that trip. That's yeah madness. Yeah, in the best possible. It was incredible. It was so. And the very last day was on Halloween, bro. It was amazing. That's uh, that's killer. And then the next day, I got back to California and I went to a haunted rave, (laughs) (laughs) which there's not really much for me. As you know, I am a can't I, slow you down. I do not indulge in no. in substances, so there's not much at raves. But I, I just I just imagine like like the episode of Samurai Jack at at the rave where it's just this pan shot of all these people just sweating <laughs> and like you might see people like popping stuff yeah. every now and again, and then just in the middle of it, you see somebody standing completely still, just like kind of vibing a little it's bit. It's just sober ass time. And that's Ty Matthews. And I'm only there because I knew there would be haunted mazes there. <laughs> um, but but actually, I think that the train ride you're referring, are you referring to my cross when I went from California to New York on yes. the train? I did that mostly for Sleep No More, <laughs> which was another thing that I did on that cross country trip. When, so that was your second time. Whenever, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. Whenever I go to New York, I always, always have to do Sleep No More. Now you told me a very, very, very interesting story about Sleep No More. Mm-hmm. So just for the sake of people who may not have heard of it, people who are, who are interested in haunts and sort of a thing, yeah. just please share, please share. It's I can't remember which story was it. Was it just? I think it was it was a general. I think it was of your most recent one. But you uh-huh. also told me a little bit about just what it is. Just what it is. Yeah, the concept. If, if people don't know, it's. It's not so much a haunt, like it's it's spooky and it's it's kind of atmospheric, but it's not it's not straight up scary. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't say um, there are creepy elements to it, but what Sleep No More is is um, it's it's immersive theater, mm-hmm. and that that has become that term has kind of become a lot more ubiquitous now. But what it is is it's a giant building. It's I think five stories. And it's designed to look like a hotel during the 1920s, 1930s. Mm-hmm. So it's very much inspired by kind of the American film noir aesthetic. What it does is it tells the story of Macbeth through that sort of 1920s, 1930s lens. Because it's it's equally inspired by Macbeth and by Hitchcock's Rebecca. Um, and so... Um, there, there are only two rules when you go inside Sleep No More. You have to wear the mask that they give you, mm-hmm. and you're not allowed to say a word. What kind of a mask? Uh, just a Harlequin mask? It's Oh, it's that. That right there. It's Interesting. It's almost similar to kind of like a Plague Doctor mask. Yeah. Um, it's it's sort of like a, a half-face uh, white mask that, cover, that covers from your forehead yeah. to just below your nose, and it's sort of like a, a just a top-level bill. Yeah. So you have your mouth... I mean, even though you can't speak, you, you are... Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. And so that's probably by design. It's probably so that people can easier breathe since they'll be wearing it for several hours. Yeah. Uh, it does get very sweaty in those masks. I bet. But um, 
you're not allowed to, to say a word and the performers don't speak either. It's all acted out completely wordlessly. Mm -hmm. And so it's very much like there's a lot of choreography and there's a lot of, um, I guess you could say interpretive dance for lack of a better term. Uh, movement. Yes. Just, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And so, but other than that, you're completely free to do whatever you want. You're free to explore the entire space. You can go floor to floor, room to room. If there's nobody in the room, you can open the drawers. You can open the cupboards. There's stuff in every single square inch of the building, of the McKittrick Hotel is what it's called, that that lends itself to the story. Um, and so when you see the actors, the actors are on a circuit. And so they'll act out a scene and then they'll move on to another scene, whatever tells the next part of their particular story. Mm -hmm. And so you're free to follow them or you're free to just go on your own and find another character. Um, I might have, I think the story that I told you was the, um, the story of kind of the one-to-ones that mm -hmm. they do where they pull people in to the scene. It was. And so, yeah. So what happened was we were watching a scene and this was actually the first time that I went. So I'm trying to remember it sort of clearly, um, we're watching this fight unfold between this couple uh, completely wordlessly. And they're the guys in a tux and she's in this gorgeous evening gown and they're, they're fighting and they're arguing. And she eventually, um, kind of grabs her bags and just sort of runs off and, mm -hmm. and leaves him. And the whole crowd is kind of following her. And eventually she stops in this hallway and it's this giant desolate hallway with this one sole spotlight in the middle and she drops her bags, and you just hear this music because the soundtrack of Sleep No More is fantastic. It's all music from the 20s and 30s and 40s. It's Glenn Miller, and it's um, the soundtrack to, to Psycho, even though that's the 60s, but there's a lot of Hitchcock. Um, and you just hear this slow, kind of beautiful music. And so she grabs me by the hand, and she she we start slow dancing to this music. And I've got this mask on, but we're like nose to nose, like locked eyes. Mm -hmm. And we're dancing and dancing. And it's just this huge surreal moment because there's a giant crowd watching us also. And eventually her eyes kind of widen and she grabs my hand and she starts running as fast as possible down the hallway. Drops the bag. Drops the bag. She's only got me by the hand. And so we're running down the hallway. And now the crowd is chasing us because they don't want to miss what is about to happen next. And we duck into this room to the side and she slams the door and she's kind of – she's breathing heavily and she's like terrified – and then all of a sudden the phone rings and she picks it up and she puts it to her ear and her eyes get wide and her face goes white and she gives the phone to me and I put it to my ear and I just hear this voice that says, get your hands off of her. And I hang up the phone and she leaves the room and just runs the other way down the hallway and the crowd chases after her and I'm left in this room going, what the hell just happened? Um, you were just George McFly. Exactly. Hey, you... <laughs> Get, get your damn, damn hands, hands off her. It was fantastic. It's oh so God. much fun. And it's the music and the lighting cues that they use are so emotionally affecting. Like I was brought to tears several times throughout the course of the story because it's so effective. Um, but that's, that's the thing that I could just go on for hours about. If mm -hmm. anyone's ever going to New York, whether or not you're predisposed to haunts, I highly recommend Sleep No More. Well, I just mentioned that it's sort of an adaptation of Macbeth, which is one of Andrea's favorite shows. Lady Macbeth is like a dream role of hers. Mm -hmm. I got to be Macbeth for a very, very short, like just selection of scenes. Interesting. Like, okay. Like not like before I really, really got Shakespeare. Sure. So like I, there was a lot of stuff that I could, that I could figure out, but it wasn't, Oh boy, could I have done that a lot better? Like right. me looking back, <laughs> looking back just like, Oh, what was I doing? doing yeah. idiot but even just mentioning uh macbeth and she would she would hit me if, if we were just saying the name so freely but this is the theater production <laughs> the, the scottish play yeah but <laughs> well because back in high school somebody proved that true there was we were doing a christmas carol at the time i'll make the, the story quick we sure. were doing the christmas story at the time and there's a guy that's was just sort of floating in and around the theater department not necessarily and I, a, a quote-unquote theater kid but he was just – he was the undertaker in the, the scene in the future where everybody's like, oh, I got his sheets. I got his this. Right. And and he was just like, I don't believe that stupid Macbeth thing. It's, it's, it's really dumb. And then about 10 minutes before his scene, nosebleed. Oh, my God. And it wasn't stopping. <gasps> was not stopping to the point where the scene was coming up. We had to send somebody on stage with a script. The second the scene ended, nosebleed stopped. 
what in the world? Yeah. That's incredible. So, like, it could have been the dry LA <laughs> weather. It could have been anything. But the fact that he was so openly like, ah, it's a bunch of bunch of crap. Oh, no. We were just like, no, you don't want to. Do- okay. I mean, it, hap- That's hilarious. it happened to me. Like, yeah. so just like, I don't want to talk about it. Uh, but, e- but either way, like, because you presented it, it's pre- it seems to be presented as more of a suspense, more of a, a theatrical experience, more so. And, and, and I like to reference any haunts or or attractions as theatrical experience because everybody's acting it is it absolutely it's it's all immersive theater to varying degrees it's just a sliding scale of well it's just a bunch of people on motorcycles or it's just (laughs) a bunch of people with chainsaws with no blades like just running after you right right like there's there's a lot there's shock there's bloody, there's suspense, there's a whole sliding scale of yeah. stuff. Yeah, well, and it, it uses a lot of the same tactics that, like, sleight of hand or magic does. Mm-hmm. I mean, like, misdirection is the most important thing. It's the cardinal rule in a haunt. You make them look this way, and then you scare them from the other direction. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and so, but there, there's a show out here in L.A. called Delusion that mm-hmm. that's running right now. That's It's more horror-oriented uh, than, than Sleep No More is, mm-hmm. but it's very much the same thing. I think at one point, Neil Patrick Harris was executive producer, and it's very, it's very theatrical, and it's very immersive. Mm-hmm. And so I think that's that's the thing that's just drawn me to haunts in general. Cause like we said, it's, it's all immersive theater in varying degrees. It's 360 art, you know, it has to be viewable from every possible perspective. Yeah. And it, there's a lot, it's a lot easier to poke holes through mm-hmm. when you have, when, when you're susceptible to any sort of a prying eye. And so I, I wanted to, to split and talk about a couple of things yeah. at that point. So when it comes to stuff being, approachable mm-hmm. i think that what what horror nights is doing is great in finding franchises that are either horror or are horror adjacent like stranger things. like stranger things mm-hmm. because you then you might get somebody who's like oh i'm a big stranger things fan i don't necessarily like horror. I'll, okay i'll go for the stranger things one right and then all of a sudden it's like all right i waited in that line for a half an hour and it was really cool i'm not going to go through that again I guess I'll go through this Universal Monsters one. Right. I guess I'll go through this Poltergeist one. Yeah, and of all sudden, there they are. They're exactly, bitten. yeah. And and is is there ever been a franchise that you were just like missed opportunity? What in terms of like something that they haven't made a maze of? Just in general, and I don't mean necessarily just Horror Nights mm-hmm. specifically, uh, but just a a haunt something a maze, that hasn't been something, adapted. A a an experience that you you want to see go from two D to three D. <sighs> that's tough. I, um, to go back to sort of like the wrestling bent, I think for a long time, I was very interested in what like a Wyatt family attraction Ooh, would look like, you know? Yeah. Um, if, if, if people aren't familiar with, with kind of that sort of thing, it's, you know, the kind of voodoo sort of Louisiana Bayou kind of aesthetic is kind of hacky and sort of well-trodden ground in, mm. in haunts. But I think, the introduction of, you know, like Harper and Rowan and the different masks that they wear and, and things like that could be interesting. One of the the earliest, the first visit to the Wyatt compound mm-hmm. is an amazing piece of video work. Yeah. Where the one minute you see Rowan in the distance in his mask just like raking some leaves or whatever. Uh-huh. And then you go back to who, something in the foreground. You'll go back and you just see the broom fall. Right. Yeah. And just like, whoa, okay, where are we? Stuff like that. Yeah. Or like um, the Hardy compound could be really fun. <laughs> like it could be scary, but like there have been a lot of mazes that are also really funny. A couple of years ago, Universal adapted This Is The End to a haunted maze. I remember that. And it was really fun really, yeah. and really, really interesting. There's, I mean, like, Comedy and horror are so kind of closely tied in so many ways, you know? Similar visceral reactions exactly. of just a quick shock to the system of either terror or laughter and how you react to either of those right. could be the same thing. Um, if if I had to pick something like non-wrestling related, um, I, I remember reading American Psycho and, and thinking that that could make a very interesting... Because the, the book, I think, gets a lot more into... Have you seen the movie? Yeah. So, like... Near the end of the movie, when it starts getting into the different kind of things that he's seeing and you're sort of, he becomes this unreliable narrator, the book kind of explores that a lot more and sort of these things that he's seeing that absolutely can't be real, but he's still seeing them. What perspective is the book from? 
I think it's first person. Okay. I'm pretty sure it's first person. And does it switch once it start once he starts to I don't think it switches uh to third person, but he just like he's seeing things that like clearly aren't they they can't be real because it's supposed to be grounded in reality. Yeah. And so that has always been sort of interesting to me as well. Um but um but I mean there's a million different things. I I was always so bummed that the cabin in the woods maze never made it to Hollywood. Mm. They did it in Orlando, but it never made it over here. Yeah, it's sometimes it's hard to tell with the the press releases, like what's going where. Yes. Um. Oh boy, what was what was the other question I wanted to ask? Oh no, I should have written this down. <laughs> talking about this, we were talking about that. Uh, what um, what what would you say to people who are reticent in making the jump to enjoy these Halloween experiences because, because for me, I, I know my limitations. Sure. I know I am, I'm a lot. I, both my wife and I are targets. Like I, I hear, talking to my friends that right. used to work at them. It's like, we like going for the big guys because that's, that's like a more, a, a bigger accomplishment. Uh-huh. The problem with me is I have a long reach right. and my hands are real big <laughs> and Oh boy, I'll probably take you out. <laughs> and I, I don't want to, I would rather, I'm very much a fan of my own space. We're going to keep how are it to you that. With the, how are you with the game Perfection? Did you ever play that as a kid? Man. Uh, Do you remember what I'm talking no, about? No, I know. I, I, I remember. <laughs> I was, I was the trying to... The tension of that game. Uh, with Gustav Gustafsson uh, as the, the Perfection guy, just because he looks like the dude from Lazy Town. <laughs> it does. He absolutely does. <laughs> no, um, it's hard to say. I had someone ask me recently, like... You know, I just, I like, someone asked me recently, I just can't, I just can't get into it. How do I enjoy them? Mm -hmm. And it's one of those things you can't really force it. Either it's your thing or it's not, you know? And I think people are trying to get into it these days just because they're becoming so popular and so ubiquitous. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's, it's certainly not for everyone. Sure. Um, but I don't know. I mean, I guess my my advice would just be to start small. Mm. Start at a at a at a small local haunt. Mm. Um, the problem is sometimes those are even scarier. But just kind of feel them out, you know. Less so, restrictions, exactly. But to your point, um, watching POV videos online mm. and maybe trying to sort of like watch them with headphones in a dark room to most closely replicate the experience and see how you do, see how you feel, see if that tension is there. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if that exactly would work, but that's, I think that's a uh, theory. Um, stuff like, like the LA haunted hayride or, or other haunted hayrides uh-huh. um, mileage could vary because <laughs> while they're only allowed to get so close to you, you're also there's nowhere to go. You have to stay on the tractor. So yeah, that's the and also when it comes to ones in that are that are less mazes and more haunts and wide open spaces, mm. I think those are more terrifying because you there's no escape. Right, like the city is way far off in the distance. We oh or, my god. So speaking of that, and I I want to get to your question that you just remember because I don't want you to forget it. No, again. that's fine. I I got it. But. Um, we recently did a haunt out in, in Corona. I grew up in Riverside in the Inland Empire, but there's a, there's a haunted attraction in Corona called Coffin Creek Mm -hmm. and it's the middle of nowhere. It's like another 15 minutes, even after you get off the freeway. No, thank you. The city is nowhere near. It's extremely poorly lit. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's dead quiet. That's one thing that I've been realizing this year that I really appreciate is when haunts have no soundtrack, no sound effects. It's just dead quiet. (sighs) I don't um, like it. It's really, really, and that's the thing. Like, it's it's so much more effective and more enjoyable for me, but it would be that much more unpleasant for you. <laughs> I don't. I mean, I don't, it's, you continue, but I have a thought. I have a thought right after that. That yeah, because the 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 theater person and and the person uh-huh. are are at such odds. Like, I, <laughs> I, I I just started working on on a show called Vampire: The Masquerade on Geek and Sundry, mm-hmm. and it's very quiet. It, the uh, Jason Carl, the the game master, is very quiet and very deliberate, and mm. speaks in a very particular way. And even when he's playing different characters, he just adds the right little bit of intonation to make you go, "That's somebody different. That's somebody different." Yeah, exactly. But it's just so it's so quiet and so eerie. You just you can't help but get closer and closer and closer. Well, and I was I was recently watching to go back to the Undertaker. I was recently watching an out of character interview that he did fairly recently. Mm-hmm. It's very very interesting. I don't know if you've seen it. I I, I know about it. it yes. I just I haven't had the time to watch it because I know he, it's pretty long. The point that he made and this point has been made in in wrestling before, but 
the guys that cut promos that were quiet were the ones that kind of made you lean forward and listen. Mm-hmm. Guys like Jake Roberts and like Chris Jericho is really good at that oh, as well. Oh, God. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so when you're you're very quiet, it forces people to listen and to kind of lean in, and that's when you can get them. Yeah. Um, but um, but yeah, the theatricality of of haunts and even just subtracting the the fear factor, I guess you could call it, is mm-hmm. just like admiring the sets and admiring the art. And I wish more haunted attractions did like lights on tours Mm -hmm. so that people that didn't want to be scared could still be able to appreciate it. There's a fantastic haunt in thousand Oaks called reign of terror Hmm. that does a lights on tour where you can just, there are no actors. None of the animatronics are turned on. You can just go in with all the lights on and just admire the sets. And it's fantastic. I, one of the things that that I hope for, for, for this show and and I'm not necessarily too afraid to to speak out Mm -hmm. for it is despite this aversion that Andrea and I have, there are a lot of friends of ours that get invited to cover these various events. So they get to see them from, from a technical perspective, as opposed to a lights, lights on or, or a, a stage lights on perspective. Sure. And, and that I'm interested in because hearing about all of the tech that was going into the walking dead attraction, that is now a year round thing, which, which is part of my question. Mm-hmm. It, the thing that ultimately made me want to come up and and I, I've I've always been so close to walking in and walking <laughs> through, but I I know especially I I knew somebody that used to be one of the the people waiting in the hospital uh-huh. who's like don't go in there man like I so I wanted to just be like hey what's up but it it, it there are so many things technologically that 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 ride in particular does that yeah. I want to check out but it's like the burning cabin especially is an incredible yeah. effect yeah. And, but, for me, it's it's the the meat hook. It's oh it's sure the, the one still moving around on the meat hook right. that that, that I, I like so much. But uh, speaking of the Walking Dead attraction, mm-hmm. you mentioned that year round haunts don't necessarily work. Now, when it comes to something like the the Walking Dead attraction, how does that compare? Does that is that a good place for people to start? Because you're it's sort of its own experience where you walk in, you walk out, and the minions are down the street as right. opposed to... <laughs> That's a good point. That's a very good point. I never thought about it that way because the year-round haunts that Universal used to do, I it's so funny because that where that maze is, there's a long history there. Mm-hmm. You know, it Different was, entrance. It, but... it was a chicken run maze originally. I didn't know it was a chicken originally, run. Originally, it was a, a chicken run um, walkthrough attraction. <sighs> then it was the Mummy. Then it was Van Helsing. Then it was Universal Monsters. I only remember it starting from Mummy. That's actually, now that I think about it, the Van Helsing maze was a very early haunt for me. I forgot to mention that. Mm. But like that was another one in that era where I was very apprehensive and very kind of anxious. But um, I think to your point, I think that that's an interesting way to think about it. The fact that you can go into this maze and and you know that there's a light at the end of the tunnel. Literally, you can come out into broad daylight and the minions are down the street and you can see Gru <laughs> and all that stuff. Um, but I don't know. The maze itself is very well done and is not that unlike what they do during Halloween Horror Night. So mileage would definitely vary because it, it, it has to be more sustainable it has to you have to be able to put people on regular shifts because the the park hours during the rest of the year are a lot longer than a, than a horror nights where right. it's the same person all night as opposed to well, all right we have to switch out who these people are sure. that person is and so like the sort of the the facial mask as opposed to individually applying scars and things like that mm. or the the series of hands coming from the hospital door that mm-hmm. are that are coming after you it's it, it's something that that i hope that more attractions do in terms of making it a little bit more real without it being <laughs> all robots that's all i want no, but it's, <laughs> it's the the closer it resembles uh an attraction versus a a haunt though that's they're not mutually exclusive sure, of sure, course sure. but that that it's it'll just it'll be the right time where I'll be able to walk through that entire thing and not punch somebody. Right. Because why don't you just go through with your hands in your pockets? <laughs> I'll rip my pockets out because <laughs> I, I I've I've done that on accident before. I have my hands <laughs> in my pockets and went, oh, I'm let me use my hand for something <laughs> and just not not like completely ruined, but just tear a little bit. And be like because that's that's sometimes like. 
it's sort of like a, a security blanket for me is yeah. if I'm wearing a hoodie, like I'll like hold onto the sleeves or like the end of the cuffs or like my pockets like in the front. You know? No man, zip tie me, <laughs> Z- zip zip tie my wrist together, and 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 put, like you go walk me through like you're a cop. Like that, that's that's the safest. Just roll you through on the Hannibal Lecter exactly. doll. Exactly. And people still try to get me and be like, eh, and then just re- <laughs> recoil back themselves. <laughs> but I think I think that. When Universal does year-round mazes, I think that's that's a little bit easier because it's an it's an attraction that's part of a bigger event. When people create bespoke year-round haunted attractions, um, it's it's a lot trickier mm-hmm. to kind of really bring those people in. And there are a lot of other factors at play. Like when we we talked about the Goratorium, but like a, a big part of that was just you know not a great location, and there were a million different factors. But I think. Not the least of which was that a lot of people just don't really want to outside of that season. Mm-hmm. Part of part of why I'm able to sort of formulate game plans and kind of make my trips to Universal and not so efficient is that I, I have to think about it in terms of, okay, what are quote-unquote casual fans going to be thinking of? Interesting. They don't realize these things are open until it's already middle of October. Mm-hmm. So if you go really early in the season, really early in the evening, you could knock everything out really quickly. Hmm. Because I think long lines can really ruin a good maze. No matter how good something is, it's not going to warrant a three-hour line, you know? Yeah, yeah. And so... Um, and so, yeah, I think part of it is just knowing how people are going to think and and things like that. Um, there are occasional events, like Th- Reign of Terror that I mentioned in Thousand Oaks. They do occasional off-season events. They'll do, if there's a Friday the 13th, they'll do that. Or they'll do, like, mm. charity events. They Because they're up in that area, up kind of closer to Santa Barbara. They had a big, like, fire benefit earlier this year for people that were affected by fire. Interesting. And so, and so yeah, so... It, Occasionally, you do get haunts that do that. Um, if they've got a building that's year round and that they're able to open, you know, during other holidays, I've seen haunts open for Valentine's Day and April Fool's Day and St. Patrick's Day and uh. Easter. And I, I did an Easter egg hunt in a haunt for Easter. Easter egg haunt? <laughs> it was an Easter egg haunt. Damn it, it was right there. <laughs> but like, you went through the maze, and in the rooms in the maze were eggs hidden that you had to go and find. What what was it like? Was there blood in the eggs? No, it oh, was okay. candy. All right, yeah, it was very fun. Yeah, sometimes it's just yeah. Sometimes it's more sometimes more, it's more innocuous whatever. than that. Oh boy, but yeah. What oh, was boy. it? What was your your question? Did you get to? I it? got to it. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, so, the, this has been this has been really enlightening. I, I I'm I'm a real big fan. Of, I could obviously of, go on about this. No, no, no. For hours and hours. I know, and and I and I would like to to talk to you a little bit more. Mm-hmm. But uh, we, we've we've been keeping this poor cast member waiting. That's that's been that called us over about an hour ago. So we should probably we should probably get to the ride. Uh, but but before we do, uh, Ty, let, let the folks know where they can find you. Yeah. and and if if they want to follow any more haunt related stuff that you're. Well, that's a fantastic segue. If they want to follow my haunt adventures, um, I write about haunts regularly for a site called uh, Haunting, mm-hmm. which is www.haunting.net. Um, this season so far, I've written about Universal, Knots, The Queen Mary, Six Flags, The LA Haunted Hayride, uh, a million little uh, attractions like indie indie attractions, things like that. Um, so that's that's where they can find me if they want to find my writing about haunts. Um, usually, I'm posting about them on social media. I'm at Ty Matthews PMA on Twitter and on Instagram and at, on Facebook, basically <laughs> facebook.com slash Ty Matthews PMA. Um, uh, what else? What else? I guess on horror related news, I'm on the Purge after show on mm-hmm. AfterBuzz TV. That's Tuesday nights for the. Well, when's this gonna go up? Tuesday. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So it'll still be going on. Yeah. Um, the Purge. Yeah, it's got a couple episodes left in the season, so I'm. I'm well, it, no matter when this goes up, people can go back and. That watch is true. It. If they watch the Purge, they can go back and watch. The, exactly. The exactly. There you go. Good point. Yeah. Um, I'm on the Purge after show on Tuesday nights. I'm on the Lucha Underground after show on people Wednesday Lucha. nights. People love Lucha. Um, I'm on Championship Wrestling from Hollywood on Saturdays at 4 p.m. People can see it on Fight TV, Tough TV, KDOC. Um, they can check their local listings. We're on a ton of, of smaller stations around the country. Um, I think that's that's pretty much it. Mm-hmm. That's that's pretty much it. But definitely haunting.net. That's that's the one that I want to get out there is because I don't uh, I don't get to write about haunts like for for many other outlets. That's where all of my stuff is. 
So so yeah, haunting.net is is where I wax poetic on haunted attractions and how effective or ineffective they may be. Ty, this has been a dang pleasure. This has been absolutely fantastic. Thank yeah. you so much for having me. We should do it again fairly soon. Uh, we'll we'll do a an off season haunts episode, or maybe we'll do something yes. where you walk you walk me through the Walking Dead attraction. <laughs> that would be fantastic. Yeah, I, we're 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 working on getting a, a GoPro so that we can start getting our own our own footage and stuff, <laughs> and that would be absolutely terrifying and one hundred percent incriminating. But <laughs> you can find me on Twitter at Mark Bidonica. Make sure to follow the show at Party of Two Pod. Thank you so much for listening to this episode, and we'll see you on the next ride.